New Delhi, December 1993, as delegates from nine high population countries began to descend on India's beautiful capital to attend the Education for All Summit, there were hopes that the event may prove to be a turning point in the history of mankind. It was in 1990 in Jom Tian's Island that delegates from more than 100 countries resolved to take advantage of the end of Cold War and transform the world agenda from war to peace. There was growing realization in the world community that the goal of education for all by the year 2000 could only be achieved if the world's nine high population countries could solve the problem of illiteracy. The Education for All Summit in Delhi was jointly sponsored by UNICEF, UNESCO and UNFPA. The key issues before the summit were an access to basic education, gender disparity in access to education, quality of education, resources and finally community involvement. I thought that on the eve of this summit, which is perhaps the first of its kind in the world, where education for all, whatever it means in all its dimensions, will be the only focus of this <coughs> gathering, the heads of states and governments of the nine most populous countries of the world, which would account for nearly 75% of the population of the world. So it is obvious that how we address ourselves to this task would very much shape the strategies and the efforts of the future. Today we must uh, start thinking in the human security in assuring that each single person would be provided with all these uh, facilities and these capacities. This is what in UNESCO we say culture of peace. We are in a transition from a culture of war to a culture of peace. And uh, I think that uh, this meeting can be an essential contribution for this transition from the past to the future, to a vision of the future that is concentrated, is focused on each human each life, that is what finally matters. Well, it's a question of what is the visualization that people have of the future of their children. Uh, when a family uh, is deeply committed to improving its lot, education is an indispensable part of it. Now, many poor people may be so feeling defeatist that they don't think they can get out of the uh, situation they're in. But then it's a question of uh, using radio, television, uh, the local school teachers, uh, getting the religious, uh, the priests, and uh, the imams in the Islam Muslim areas, get them all to talk up education. I think that we should consider a two-pronged uh, approach. One is, of course, to try to educate boys and girls, and in that also try to include some elements of how to change attitude and behavior. We talk about, you know, gender neutral uh, um, content of education, but I think it should be m more than that. It should be gender positive, and equity means to me changing of the role of both women and of men. This is essential. Every day, there are a quarter of a million more persons on the planet. Every day. This means that every four days we have a million more. This is a problem for all of us, not only for some countries, for the world as a whole. We are one or none today. We are in the same boat. I think the summit uh, within its own domain is very important because first it reinforces what the different countries are doing. Say, countries sometimes could be in isolation and they think their problems are the only problems in the world or their innovations are the only innovations in the world. So when they get together, particularly that they are of large sizes, which means they have similar problems, problems of decentralization, problems of numbers, uh, problems of uh, marginalized groups, uh, uh, pockets of, of places that are unreachable and so on. So there are common problems which they share with, with one another and at the same time each of these countries has been able to approach 
these issues of reaching uh, uh, the, the constituency for basic education, mobilizing local resources, mobilizing society from different angles. And the summit has been able to be a forum for countries to share with one another not only the problems, but also the solutions. The most important component of the EFA summit was the pre-summit ministerial deliberations held between December 13 to 15th in the convention center of Hotel Taj Palace. During these meetings, a number of background papers were presented by educationists and sponsoring agencies. Education ministers from different countries chaired panel discussions on themes concerning resource mobilization, community participation, and women empowerment. There was unanimity that women empowerment was necessary to attain total literacy. The participants shared their experience, their success stories, and their frustrations. Each member nation realized that both success and failure were part of the struggle against illiteracy. After a number of late night meetings and discussions, the contours of a unanimous resolution and framework of action began to take shape. There was a consensus on the view that failure to maintain the momentum in the field of education will have adverse consequences on economic growth, demography, health and women empowerment. The most tangible outcome of the summit was the recognition of the tools of distance education to attain the objective of EFA 2000. Distance education was seen as a positive spin-off of advances in the field of information and communication technology. The realization that the resolution and framework of action could reshape the destinies of three billion people added greater urgency and seriousness to the deliberations. Delegates were unanimous that education could empower the poor and the dispossessed. The efforts in high population countries like Bangladesh, Brazil, China, Egypt, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Nigeria and Pakistan was expected to have a beneficial multiply effect on other countries of the world. A photo exhibition reaffirmed the underlying unity in the nine participating countries. Delegates reiterated their commitment to the goals of EFA 2000. We hope that with the commitment of the leaders of the nine high population developing countries for ensuring education for all, more generous international support to the effort of the national government will be forthcoming. Before I conclude, I would like to reiterate our commitment to eradicate illiteracy and arch upon all the potential bilateral and multilateral donors to provide needed support for achieving our targets by the year 2080. If we fail to do so, we shall be failing in our duties to usher in a new century of peace and happiness. You see, we have tried uh, we would, uh, for the uh, education primarily with our own budget. We are spending a lot of money for the primary educations, for the secondary educations, and in general for educations to develop the country and to make the people literate by 2000 AD. Now, uh, financial constraints are there, but even though there are financial constraints, we are putting the highest amount in our education sector, cuttling down some other sectors, and uh, with the help of our own budget, it's not possible to meet the exigencies, and therefore, uh, we need the international cooperation in this respect. In Brazil, we are delighted with the commitment assumed in John Tien, and we are determined to consolidate the new conclusions of New Delhi, not only inside the government, but above all uh, within society as a whole. Indeed, Brazil has accepted full responsibility for attaining health of all for everyone. And uh, the Brazilian education system is making up for last time. The challenges are vast, and we are trying to attain legitimate claims of an organized society. 
Mas Como o é? Brasil tem um programa especial de retenção da criança na escola, que é o Programa Nacional de Atenção Integral à Criança e ao Adolescente. Programa Nacional de Atenção National Integral program. à Criança e ao Adolescente. We have a special program that tries to retain students in schools, which is a national program of care for children in schools. This program assures children care from birth, includes house, adequate nutrition, sports, leisure, and cultural activities. It is worthwhile insisting on the fact that the Brazilian government seeks to guarantee to children nutrition at school, which is a very important element for attracting children to school. The development of human resources is no less important than that of natural resources, which should be the focus of attention, especially in developing countries. Education should therefore by no means be neglected while efforts are made to develop the national economy. On the contrary, it should be purposefully strengthened. While it is true that education, which needs large investment, will only produce expected results in many years to come, long-term and sustainable economic development will only be possible with a well-founded educational system and well-educated people. The total number of illiterates in China at this moment is about 180 million. But when we are talking about the age group from 15 to 45, the numbers are about 50 million. The Chinese government pays great attention to the work of elimination of illiteracy in the country, and the government have promulgated this regulation on literacy programs. According to this regulation, each year there will be 5 million people who can be rid of illiteracy through our programs. That means, by the end of the century, the number of illiterates among the age group 15 to 45 will be less than 5%. Uh. I bring to you the firm belief of the people and governments of the Arab Republic of Egypt in the development of education. President Mubarak is determined that the project, the national project of Egypt, will be the development of education until the end of the century. For indeed, education is uh, the most important investment in that which is the most valuable human beings. It is an essential tool for the achievement of human development, the secret of progress. It generates creativity, global sustained development. We are uh, concentrating on basic education first. We are building a huge number of schools. Uh, this year we are completing 1,500 new schools. And this will go on each year till we finish 7,500 schools by the age, uh, by the year 2000. This is an enormous achievement because this will uh, enable us uh, to attain uh, full enrollment of our uh, children by the year 2000 in one shift a day. Because now we have more than one shift and in a reasonable class density because we have a very high class density and uh, if we have a full day activity in the school we will be able to teach well uh, we will be able to have educational activities in the school we as a nation are conscious of this challenge and would face it squarely with determination and resolve in this task however we have an important new ally namely the innovative system of distance education as well as numerous other modern devices that will make teaching and learning a pleasant experience and an accelerated process. This will open a new vista of success and achievement. We have in the National Policy and Education 1986 and its program of action an excellent framework for guiding the national effort. Total awareness about the need for literacy, which was previously the concern of NGOs and individuals, to give it a programmatic framework. 
And uh, what is heartening along with that is the commitment of all shades of public opinion. Whereas previously people thought this is the responsibility of the state or whoever is involved in that effort. Now cutting across all political, socio-economic, all considerations, everyone is involved. I think this alone is a big achievement. And the mobilization that it generates is the momentum which will carry this campaign to success. We are appealing to the developed countries to give our children the opportunity to acquire science and technology that will be beneficial to the development of our nation. Give our children a chance to develop themselves so that eventually they will serve the nation's development and the loftier development of humankind. We believe pr that providing a maximum education accompanied by a deeper sense of religion can give our children, generation yet to come, a much brighter future. We have a very big program for self-learning because Indonesia is a, a big, a fast country consisting of 13,000 islands. And there are uh, places where there are very, very sparsely populated. So we must have a, the so-called um, distance learning, you see, or we call it out of school learning, in which through tutors, we uh, educate uh, children who, because of some reasons, cannot go to school. For instance, when there are no school buildings. Second is when the children have to, has to work, have to work for the parents. So in the morning they work in the fields, in, at sea, at, in the river, or in the, uh, in the woods. But in the afternoon they will be collected and then learned. You see. We call that out of school learning. And uh, well, we are, I can say that we are quite successful in that, to reach the remote regions. The rich historic and cultural heritage that our nations have is a solid basis in order to face the future with confidence. It is up to the present generation to nourish and renew our legacy of thinking, to adapt our knowledge to a changing reality, to a dynamic reality, and first and foremost, to release through education the huge potential for creativity and transformation of our peoples. We tried a, a very successful program, by the way, which we call a, a communitarian instruction, by means of which uh, a, young, a young person instructed intensively in the urban areas and uh, equipped with a, with a handbook very uh, carefully designed by pedagogues and specialists in, in, in different areas, goes to these uh, uh, distant rural settlements and uh, provide uh, education for children uh, 6 to 14 years old, uh, where there's no school at all. No? So, the community itself provides the, the, spa the, 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 the scholar space. Uh, they, they feed the instructor during a certain period of time. And uh, these, uh, these children and youngsters receive uh, intensively uh, basic education. Greater attention is being paid to the educational needs of such undeserved, undeserved groups as preschool children, early livers, particularly girls, young and adult illiterates, street children, gifted and handicapped, as well as children of nomads and migrant fishermen. Our exertions directed at improving delivery of basic education in terms of access, equity, quality, and relevance have so far produced only mixed results. But great is our resolve to ensure that A, the Board of Basic Education does not leave behind any of those who should be on board. I think it is more a question of uh, uh, economic inequalities 
where you find in those areas which are economically more backward, particularly certain sectors of the urban population, uh, you find that the, probably the education of women is not as good as it should be. Uh, but this, then when you go to the rural areas, it becomes even more critical. So the issue of uh, uh, edu uh, educational opportunities is, is more graduated along those type of uh, income distribution and inequality of opportunities rather than strictly a gender question. We believe that to provide meaningful education to the masses, education has to be a mass movement. It has to be indigenous, it has to be responsive to the needs, and it has to be designed, planned, and managed by the people themselves. One implication of this strategy is that education has to be delivered through the institutions, structures, and systems which belong to the masses, which they are familiar with, and which form a part of their social milieu. This is the public-private partnership which is now the cornerstone of our policy to achieve the objectives of education for all within the shortest possible span of time. In Pakistan, as you know, a vast majority of our children study the Quran. And so they learn Arabic, and they learn to sight-read Arabic, which makes it, of course, much easier for them to learn the Urdu script, which is based on the Arabic script. And so through the mosque schools also, there has been an effort um, which is in fact on quite a large scale now where literacy classes are being held and literacy classes are now moving beyond literacy classes actually into primary schools for the out of school children. The venue of the summit was the refurbished convention center of Vigyan Bhavan. The three days of pre-summit ministerial level meetings and the resultant summit resolution got a formal seal of approval in this majestic hall. The summit was inaugurated by President of India, Dr. Shankar Dayal Sharma, by lighting the traditional lamp of literacy. The summit was addressed by President Suharto of Indonesia, the Vice Premier of China, and Chairman of the summit, the Indian Prime Minister, Mr. P. V. Narasimha Rao. Education ministers from other countries read out the messages of their respective heads of state. Human Resources Minister Arjun Singh read out the report on the pre-summit inter-ministerial meetings. He felt that humanity and mankind would be defined by the decisions taken during the summit. The report took cognizance of the fact that as nine countries accounting for more than half of the world's population and 70% of adult illiterates it was in the hands of these nations to change the educational situation in the world. The cause of education for all, in my view, is perhaps one of the most important endeavors being undertaken in the world today, as truly it seeks to open a new chapter in the history of humankind. Thank you. The Secretary General of the Conference may now kindly read the declaration. I am very happy to say that there was complete unanimity in arriving at the declaration in its present form and it's with great pleasure that I present this to you. The declaration. We, the leaders of nine high population developing nations of the world, hereby affirm our commitment to pursue with utmost zeal and determination the goals set in 1990 by the World Conference on Education for All and the World Summit on Children to meet the basic learning needs of all our people by making primary education universal and expanding learning opportunities for children, youth and adults. We do so in full awareness that our countries contain more than half of the world's people and the success of our efforts is crucial to the achievement of the global goal of education for all.